Good evening, friends. This is Pastor Davis. This is the day that the Lord has made. We rejoice and we are glad in it. Thank you for tuning in tonight to another edition of Power for Life, uh, the Wednesday night Bible study experience of the Bella Vista Missionary Baptist Church. To all of our members and to all of our virtual visitors and friends, thank you so much for joining, joining in and logging on tonight. And before we go another further in diving into the Word of God, you know what I want you to do. Click that like button, comment on it to greet somebody in the social sanctuary, and then I want you to share this on your Facebook timeline, or you can share the YouTube link uh, with uh, somebody in your circle of friends or even in your contacts so that they can join in with us in the Word tonight. I want to breathe the word of prayer, and then I want to hop right into tonight's lesson to hear what the Word of God wants to impart to us tonight. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the blessing of this day. We thank you for how you have kept us, for how you have sustained us and maintained us. We thank you that you have moved us throughout the various experiences of this day by your power. And God, whatever we have experienced today, those of us who trust in your son by faith and we trust you with the whole of our lives, we know that everything that has happened to us today was according to your will. Or if it was not according to your will, we know that you would work it together for our good because you love us and we are called according to your purpose. Thank you for this opportunity to open and study your word tonight. Give us open minds and open hearts to be receptive to what you have to say. Give us the focus that we need. Help us to identify and to remove any distraction or deterrent that might hinder us from focusing singularly on the study of your word. Fill us up tonight so that we can have power for life. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, brothers and sisters, I want to tonight, I want to tonight pick up uh, in our series of study that we have been in all year long entitled Faith Over Feelings, Christ Over Culture. We have been journeying through the book of Galatians, and that's where I want to pick up again tonight. I want to pick up uh, in Galatians chapter 5, Pastor Bobby Thomas, who partners with me in teaching, uh, concluded chapter 4 on last week. Today I want to pick up in Galatians chapter number 5 to uh, hear, uh, for us to hear and learn and glean uh, from what the Word of God wants to teach us tonight about our faith in Jesus Christ, uh, how we can walk more authentically in that faith how we can dispel and dismiss uh, some of the, uh, the false proclaimed truisms uh, about uh, the gospel and what it means to be a relationship with Christ. Because whatever relationship that we have with Christ, we want it to be an authentic one and we want it to be a relationship that is built on the truth of scripture. That is built on the truth of the gospel. Not what we feel or what other people feel and they proclaim it as truth. But what we want our faith to be built, as the hymn writer says, on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. We dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. So let's look at Galatians chapter 5 tonight. And there is a line, a phrase rather, in verse number 13 from the New Revised Standard Version. Uh, it's in verse number 13, and I want to use that phrase to tag tonight's lesson. I, I want to teach us very quickly tonight from this thought, called to freedom. Called to freedom. Will you type that in the chat section or in the comment section? Will you make it your next status? Called to freedom. Let's pick up in verse number one of chapter five. To listen to what Paul has to say, and we'll read through verse 15 very quickly. Paul says, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Listen, I, Paul, am telling you that if you let yourself be circumcised, Christ will be of no benefit to you. Once again, I testify to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obliged to obey the entire law. 
you who want to be justified by the law have cut yourselves off from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. For through the spirit by faith, we eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything. The only thing that counts is faith working through love. If you are reading that in your Bible, highlight or underline that uh, in your Bible app as well. Verse 7, you were, wanting, you were running well. Who prevented you from obeying the truth? Such persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough. I am confident about you in the Lord that you will not think otherwise. But whoever it is that is confusing you will pay the penalty. But my friends, why am I still being persecuted if I am still preaching circumcision? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who unsettle you would castrate themselves. Whew. Harsh language by Paul there. Verse 13, for you were called to freedom. That's the line. You were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence. But through love, become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. Look at verse 13 again. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. Called to freedom, called to freedom, called to freedom. Again, just some quick background. Paul is still pressing his argument, which is the argument that threads the whole letter, that we are saved. By our faith in Jesus Christ, not by works of the flesh. That we are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, the finished work of Jesus Christ, not the human work of the hand, namely the act of circumcision. Paul, again, is uh, arguing to these new believers, these Galatians, trying to separate them or turn them away from the teachings of these Judaizers who have been impressing upon them the need for them to be circumcised in order for them to be saved. So Paul has been pushing this argument throughout the letter, trying to get them to understand that submit yourself to the work of the flesh or to some human effort in order to be saved. You are literally enslaving yourself to the sin that comes under the law but you are only been made you are only made free from the law and thus made free from the bondage of sin if you submit your life by faith to what Jesus Christ has done on the cross and I really hope that you have been getting this this has been uh, some very, very, uh, what we call in, 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 the, in the theological world, this has been some, some very, very high and, and deep Christology, right? The study of what Christ has done for us who believe, right? And so he's, he's really trying to get them to make what Jesus Christ has done the center of their faith, to make the cross the center of their faith. To make the gospel, the true gospel, that is gospel by grace in, what he, in, in his blood, to make that the center of their faith. Not some other ideology or some other feeling, right? Not some other false gospel that's being proclaimed. He wants them to have their faith rooted in the truth of the gospel because it is then and only then that they and we can experience the hope of a righteousness in Christ. None of us can be made right by ourselves, right? Even in our righteousness, the Bible says we are just filthy rags, right? 
the only way we are right, to use another biblical word, justified, declared right before God, is through the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood saves us, the blood justifies us, the blood makes us right. But more than anything, what Paul is trying to get over in Galatians chapter 5 is that the blood gives to us new access to freedom in Christ. That through our faith in Christ, through the shed blood of Christ on the cross, we have been called to freedom. And so Paul is juxtaposing two, two things here. If you continue to believe or live under the works of the law, you are still living a life that is enslaved to sin. On the other hand, if you live your life by faith in what Jesus has done, you have been, in the words of verse 13, called to freedom. That you have liberty in Christ. That where the spirit of the Lord is, the scripture says in another place, there is liberty. Or as John 8 and 36 says, whom the Son sets free. Y'all finish that for me in the chat section. Whom the Son sets free is what? Is free indeed. That Christ has liberated us from all of the obligations of the law. He became our righteousness in fulfilling every obligation of the law so that we can live free and full lives under grace in him. He gave us life and that more abundantly. And so as we read through chapter 5 tonight, you can see Paul again pressing this argument. And I won't go through every detail of, of what he mentioned in, in the first 12 or so verses. But what Paul again is trying to get these Galatians to understand that if you continue to think that circumcision is important, this work of the flesh, if you continue to think that, that, that then, then what Jesus has done is of no benefit to you. But then he will say something um, in, uh, I, I want to say it's, it's in verse 6. Look at verse 6 again. Watch what he will say in verse 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything. The only thing that counts is faith working through love. Paul is saying now that Christ has come, it's no longer about what you do or what you do not do in your flesh. But what your relationship with God is about now, this is how you gain access to God now. This is how you live as a person of faith now. You have your faith working through love, not by the law. Your faith no longer works through the law, what you do. Your faith now works through love, right? So let's, let's, let's dig into a little bit about this, this, this Christian freedom. That in Christ, I, I'm no longer, we are no longer obligated or under subjection to any of the Old Testament, all of those things that we looked at in the past and Deuteronomy and Leviticus and all, all of those different laws, they, those things are no longer over our heads, right? But rather, we are called to live free. In other words, now that we are under grace, we really have the opportunity to live more full and complete lives, not under the judgment of God, right? Now, we may, meet, we may be under the judgment of other people, but when it comes to the judgment of God, Christ has freed us from that, right? That, okay, let me, I'm trying to skirt around it because I don't want to cause too much of an uproar, but most of you have been engaged in, in conversations uh, and even some of the things that have been passed down to us as truth in, in some uh, church settings, things that have been taught to us perhaps uh, out of some uh, some, some, some Puritan or uh, some kind of other uh, spiritual dispensation that, that we have built 
theologies and, and, and frameworks around. Uh, and so we've, we've had different debates and arguments. And you, you hear people have discussions. You know, if, you, if you're a Christian, uh, there, there are certain things uh, you, you can eat or you cannot eat or that you can wear or cannot wear. If you're a Christian, if you're a believer in Christ, if you follow God, you're, 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 not, you're not supposed to, uh, to have a, a, a top shelf margarita or you're not, you're not supposed to go out and hang out in certain settings or uh, you're not supposed to listen. You know, some of us uh, grew up in, in a holiness tradition or uh, we, we, where, you know, everything that had the appearance of, of worldliness that you, that you were, we were called to separate ourselves from that. You, you know the scriptures, you know, come ye out from amongst them and, and, and be ye separate. You know, we are a, a holy people, a, 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 a peculiar people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation called out from darkness into the marvel. All of those scriptures, which are true and accurate. But I think a lot of times, in most instances, a lot of those scriptures have been taken out of salvific context. They have been taken out of the context for, of salvation. And what I mean by that is when Christ died for sin, Christ died for all sin. And he freed us from any obligation under the law. Right, which means, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, don't, 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 don't hang up on me, don't log off on me, stay with me because I, I'm, I'm going somewhere with it. Which means, that as a believer, there is no music that you want to listen to that you cannot, that you're not allowed to listen to. Technically, there's nothing that you want to wear that you cannot wear. There's no place that you want to go that you cannot go. We, we have. The liberty to do that. But look at what ver verse 13 says. We have been called to freedom in Christ. But here's the issue. Our freedom also comes with Christian responsibility. He says, do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence. But through love become slaves to one another. Here, here's the issue. When, again, we're talking about faith over feelings. Here's the issue that a lot of us feel that we have a right to, but it's actually incorrect. And here, here's what causes a lot of not just issues that we see in churches, but things that we see in our society, things that we see in our community. A lot of believers erroneously think that just because you are now under grace and not under the law, that just because you have faith in Jesus Christ, we believe it gives us a license to do anything. That's what we feel. You know, I can do that and all, you know, if I, if all, all and, I, and I'm right with God. No, freedom comes with responsibility. Yes, we, we are free. We have been called to freedom. We have liberty, but there's a responsibility with our liberty. There's a responsibility with our freedom, right? That we should use that as an, not as an opportunity for self-indulgence. The King James Version calls it the flesh, the flesh. We believe, some of us, erroneously, that we can feed our flesh anything or we can gratify our flesh in any kind of way that we want just because we are covered by grace. And what the scripture will teach us is that any time that we seek to live any kind of way that we want to live or do anything that we want to do, what we do is we, we, we in, a, in, a, in a very roundabout way, make the grace of God no effect in our lives. I like something that John Piper says about self-indulgence. John Piper says that self-indulgence is spiritually dangerous to us because it's a form of idolatry. It's a form of idolatry. It's something that we turn to instead of turning to God for our joy and our happiness. In other words, 
when, when, we, con when we consistently self-indulge and overindulge and do things that only please us, with no conscious or responsibility to our Christian witness or to the light that God has called us to be in a dark world or to, the, to be the salt of the earth that Jesus has called us to be. When we live with no, with no conscious effort in that direction, we misappropriate the grace of God. We are called to freedom, but our freedom comes with responsibility. This is the simple lesson for tonight. You cannot do what you want to do just because you are covered by grace. Can I say it again? You cannot do what you want to do. You cannot live however you want to live just because you are covered by grace. Grace comes with responsibility it comes with the responsibility turn to Romans chapter 6 really quick Romans chapter 6 Look at what Paul says, and I'm, I'm just going to hop around a bit, a bit, beginning at verse number 1 in Romans 6. Paul is dealing with the issue of grace versus sin and, and living under grace. He says, what then are we to say? Should we keep sinning? Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? In other words, should I keep doing whatever I want to do just because I know that I'm under grace? By no means. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? In other words, when you gave your life to Jesus Christ and you went down into the waters of baptism publicly acknowledging and confessing that you identify with Christ and then you were buried with Christ in your baptism in a, in a similar way and you were resurrected with Christ in a similar way and the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Jesus Christ lives on the inside of you how can you just keep doing whatever you want to do? What does that say about the authenticity of your faith? If you just get on social media and post whatever you want to post, post whatever kind of pictures that you want to post that are not assets to your Christian witness. Right? How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into his death. So that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in the newness of life. Right? Verse 12, I'm hopping down. Therefore, do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passion. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under the law but under grace. Let me, let me put a cord in the meter and park here for a second. Again, we, our goal this year is building up the body, and we're talking about spiritual growth as individual disciples and as a church collectively. And what hinders some of our growth is that we claim salvation, but we still live sin. <whistles> right? We claim salvation, but we still live sin. And it's all because we know we got grace to fall back on. And Paul is saying that the longer you let sin have dominion in your body, what happens is, is that you let the power of sin and the effects of sin have rule over you. But don't give your body over to self-indulgence. And self-indulgence comes in a lot of ways. All those idolatrous ways that we put ourselves at the center of things. When that happens, 
you, are, you can no longer be used as an instrument of righteousness, which is what we have been called to, to be instruments of righteousness. Verse 20, I'm dropping down. Matter of fact, no, let me back back up to verse 15. What then? Should we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey? If you keep doing, if you keep obeying your body and the desires of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, if you keep obeying all of that and just giving over to your self-indulgences, Guess what? You are still a slave to sin. You are a slave to whatever you obey. You are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or obedience, which leads to righteousness. Verse 17, but thanks be to God that you, having once been slaves of sin, have become, have become obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you were entrusted, and that you and that you, having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. Verse 20. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. In other words, God, God wasn't holding it against you. So what advantage then did you get from the things of which you are now ashamed? Has, has living a life of self-indulgence ever just helped you? Has it ever been to your benefit? How much trouble, and some of you can look at where you are now or look at some of your past experience. How much trouble have you gotten yourself in? And what I mean by you is your, 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 your over self-indulgence, giving in to your desires, giving in to your thoughts, giving in to what you want to do and how you want to live. Has that ever just been to your benefit? Paul says, what advantage did you get from those things of which you are now ashamed? Some of us can look back over the, some, of, some of the things that we have did, some of the decisions we've made, and, and we just hang our heads and we say, I can't believe I, I, was, I, I, I was that weak-minded or I, I, was, I was attached so much to that, to, to that habit or to that person or to that, to that uh, whatever it was, that way of living. I was attached to, so much to it that it caused me to do all kinds of of things that I regret now. Paul says the end of those things is death, not just physical death, but other things dying in your life. But now that you have been freed from sin and enslaved to God, the advantage that you get is sanctification. If you live a life that's obedient to God, your advantage now is that each day God is sanctifying you. In other words, every day God is making you better. He's washing you, he's cleaning you, and pulling those things away from you that are not for your development but to your detriment. Now that you obey Christ, each day you are being sanctified by his spirit. And what ultimately happens is that the end is eternal life. Verse 23, we all know that, Romans 6 and 23, for the wages of sin is death. Living under sin always gives you a paycheck of death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so we have not, we've been called to freedom, but our freedom comes with responsibility. I don't care how much you feel like you can do what you want to do. That's not what it means to have faith in Jesus Christ. It's not what it means. Faith-filled freedom should drive us to love God more, to serve one another more, out of our love for God, right? Even though we are free and liberated under the law, that comes with responsibility. Can I, can I show you one more thing? Uh, go to, um, real quick, 1 Corinthians chapter number 8. We have a clear example of this in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. So when Paul is writing to the Corinthian church, he's writing to address some issues that they are dealing with. And uh, one of the questions that comes up to Paul is, uh, there has been uh, some, some meat, this is some, some meat that was um, 
being offered to or sacrificed to these idol gods. And some of the believers in Corinth were uh, indulging that meat. You know, they, they ain't going to let a good barbecue go to waste. So, like, uh, I'm going to have me one of these ribs. Even if it was offered to one of these idol gods, <laughs> I'm going to have me, you know, ha have me a rib or, so or something uh, to, to satisfy my, my hunger. And, and Paul, they want to know if believers should be eating anything that has been sacrificed to, to an idol god. And Paul writes to them in Corinthians chapter number 8, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, to address this issue. And in summation, when you look at it, you can read it in more detail. I'll just give you the Cliff Notes version. Paul says to them that believers in Christ under grace, we have the freedom to do anything that we want. In other words, it's nothing wrong with you eating a piece of barbecue that's been offer it to an idol because he will say in that chapter, we don't believe in them idols anyway. We just believe in the one true and living God. So uh, eating, that, eating that meat, that sacrifice, that ain't got nothing to do with us because we don't have that intent. All we're doing is eating a piece of meat. And so we, we have every right to indulge in that. But Paul would say in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 that although all things are lawful, Although all things are permissible, I'm allowed to have this freedom to do what I want. He will follow that up by saying, all things are not beneficial. All things are permissible, but all things are not beneficial. And he's not talking about just for himself, but he's also talking about for the witness of others around him. Paul would say in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, listen, we are no better... We are no better or no worse as a consequence of eating meat sacrificed to idols. But what we have to be mindful of are the consciousness of the people around us. And so if they are weak-minded people who do not have a strong footing in what it truly means to be in a relationship with Christ, he says, out of my love for Christ and my love for them, and my desire for other people to want to be saved. Here's the thing, a lot when we go back to self-indulgence, a lot of it is born out of selfishness. And as believers, the worst thing that we could do is be selfish. Paul says, jumping back to Galatians chapter 5, the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Right? So if I love my neighbor as myself, I have to understand this is our responsibility. Some of you are saying that ain't fair. Listen, it's what we've been called to. This is our witness. It's permissible. It's allowed. But if it's going to cause other people to stumble, then I have to refrain from it because I have to keep their consciousness in mind. I have to keep it in mind. Right? So am I allowed to have a drink? Absolutely. But should I do that in front of people who believe that Christians ought not drink? No, because I don't want them to stumble. Am I allowed to go out and sit in the club and listen to music? You're right, I am. Am I allowed to dance and have fun? Absolutely you are. But if it's going to cause other people to stumble, if they look at me and see me praise dancing in church and, you know, twerking in the middle of the floor at the party, I, I got to be aware of that because it's about my witness to Christ. Can I post pictures and, and post different statuses on my social media? You absolutely can. You have the liberty. But if the kind of picture that I post or the type of things that I write are going to be a hindrance to my witness or to somebody else's faith, guess what? I got to refrain from it because my love for God and my love to want to see them in relationship with God has to be stronger than my desire to indulge in what I want to do. It's tight but it's right. All things are lawful, but not all things are beneficial. We are called to freedom but we're not to use our freedom as an opportunity to self-indulge, self-indulgence. So, where, where, where I want to end tonight, where I want to get off tonight is 
really a call to, to self-examination. There, there's a whole lot I could say, uh, some other scriptures that I could, uh, I could lift up. I could lift up uh, what, what the Hebrews talks about, what the writer of the Hebrews talks about, what we have been called to lay aside every weight and the sin that easily besets us so that we can run the race of God with patience, right? What's holding a lot of us back from running the race of God, running the race of faith, in the best way is that we keep living lives of self-indulgence, but we got to lay that weight aside. I, I can get into all of that. I can get into what Peter says in, in 1 Peter 2 and 11 about, again, living uh, in a way that, that we do not gratify our flesh because we don't want non-believers, again, uh, to have any accusation against Christ or any accusation against the people of God. But, but, but what I want to get into with, without repeating information and without holding you too long online tonight is just, again, ending with some self-examination. What are the areas in your life, where are the areas in your life where you are overindulging in self-indulgence? Where you are just giving your flesh carte blanche. Pray and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal that to you. Or some of you may already know where and what that area is. Pray and ask God to reveal that to you because, one, that area is more than likely hindering your spiritual growth. And two, it is becoming a stumbling block to your ultimate purpose in God, which is being conformed to the image of Christ and being a witness to others for Christ. Have you been selfish with your salvation? And that selfishness coming through you self-indulging, giving in to your flesh. Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal that to you. And I want you to pray that once the Holy Spirit reveals that to you, I want you to also then begin to pray and read the word of God, study the word of God to see what are some things that you can build into your life where you can have some spiritual accountability, if you will, so that you learn how to live according to the spirit, not according to the flesh. Yes, you have grace, but grace is not a license do what you want to do. Yes, you were called to freedom, but we are to use that freedom in loving service to God and in loving service to one another. Right? We don't want to become a stumbling block to ourselves. We don't want to become a stumbling block to other people. That's really the gist of it, y'all. I, I could get into more detail, but I'll pick up next week uh, in verses 16, beginning at verse 16, all the way to the end of the chapter. Familiar verses to many of us, where Paul begins to differentiate the difference between living a life according to the flesh and living a life according to the spirit. And if you live a life according to the spirit, then your life will begin to produce the fruit of the spirit. We'll talk about that next week in Power for Life. But for now... Let me thank you for joining me tonight. If you got something powerful or something personal out of this Bible study tonight, I want you to share it and I want you to tag Bella Vista in it uh, so that we can send it around the World Wide Web, uh, send it around to different uh, spaces so that we can get the Word of God out tonight and we can draw someone in who may want to experience the teaching that's going on at Bella Vista. Listen, I love you and I cannot wait to see you this weekend in worship. If you have an offering to give tonight, uh, make good use of our digital giving platforms, our website, our text to give, or you can mail your gift in to our church address, and it will be received in a safe and a secure way. I want to pray for you one last time, and then I'll let you go for this evening. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for your word. Thank you that you have made us free through your blood and if we have trusted in what you have done by faith, we receive your grace and we have been called to freedom. But our prayer tonight, God, is that by your Holy Spirit, you will reveal to us the things in our lives that may have strongholds over us.
the things in our lives that we may be overindulging in, the works of the flesh that may be causing, that may be hindering our own spiritual growth and causing others to stumble because of how we live our lives. Let us know, God. Remind us, I pray, that this word has done that, that our freedom comes with responsibility. And we want to be responsible believers. It's not about what we feel. It's about what is right and ultimately what is God honoring and faith building. We love you and we thank you for your word tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Go in peace, go in love, and go in joy. And I'll see you this weekend. Have a great week, family.